Amen, amen, amen. Um, okay, so this is the new series, uh, Messy Matrimony, because it's for real. And I know your marriage is not messy. It's the couple behind you. Um, and so you get to nap through this entire series because God's going to work on them. Amen? All right, sweet. Um, so we're going to focus not just on married people, but we're going to focus on people who are dating, people who are in, in engagement. Uh, Linda and I are taking a lot of stuff from our premarital class, and we're bringing it into this series so that we can just kind of scoop up everybody. And some of you guys are like, I'm single, and you're not scooping me up. Yes, we're going to. We're going to find our way to do that, and we're going to be talking about how God might have some of you in a single season of life, and that's something that's going to come up multiple times during this series. But let me just tell you that I love you and that having a Christian marriage is not the pinnacle of God's will for the Christian life. It's not. It's a huge blessing, and churches talk about it a lot, but God wants to use you right where you're at right now. And he wants to love you right where you're at right now. And so we're going to talk about that. And so there's going to be things, so, some of it may be preparation for a relationship that's ahead. Some of it may be explanation for a relationship in the past that went wrong. But God is going to bless you and God's got things to say to you. So singles, you were not left out. Okay, today's topic. Um, this is a pastoral talk. I'm going to put it under that category because for years and years, if you're a pastor, you get to talk to a lot of people with broken marriages. And I've talked to a lot of people with broken marriages and I've seen a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And today's message is a reaction to that pain. It's, it's where I think it's, it, this is foundational. I think it's where we need to start. Here's the number one thing that I think causes marriages to go wrong and to not work. And that's a big claim. It's that we're doing contract, not covenant. And I know those are fancy words. And we're going to define those words, amen? We're going to define those words because those words matter. But there's something that, that we just design wrong into our romantic relationships. And we design it wrong when we're dating, when we're engaged. And of course, it's broken once we finally get married. And, and a lot of us, our parents taught us to do it wrong. So it's your parents' fault, amen? Oh, we got to blame our parents for more things. Okay, so let's, let's start out with contract. What's this difference between contract and covenant? First off is contract. Now, we all know what contracts are and agreements are, right? Like, we all know that. Like, you go to the uh, car dealership and you buy a new car, and they're going to make you sign a piece of paper, and that's the contract. And what does it say? It says there's two parties here. One of us is going to get a new car. The other of us, or one of us is going to give you a new car, I should say. The other of us is going to make payments, right? They give me the car. I make the payments. If either of us fails in our duty, the contract is off. Yes? And there's consequences for that. They will come and impound the vehicle. Like we just know that. So many different kind of contracts that I could talk to you about. But here's what it is. At the end of the day, it is a conditional agreement based on your performance and based on their performance. And as long as everybody's performing, everything's good. But when they don't, I'm out. And we've brought that into marriages. Oh boy. Have we brought it into marriages? Now, when you go into the Bible, if, you, if you're a like, super Bible student this morning, and I use the word covenant, you already know what that means. It's, it's this ancient agreement. It was almost like a blood oath that they would enter into. And that ancient agreement, they were often conditional. Okay, so just the word covenant in the Bible does not mean that it's unconditional. But there were unconditional covenants. And you'll see the very first one if you study deeply in Genesis chapter 15 with Abraham. Abraham and God have this moment. And I'm not going to describe the whole thing to you because it's kind of ancient and blood ritual and kind of funky. But Abraham and God have this moment where God says, this is going to be a different kind of covenant. And you're not going to do anything, Abraham. I'm the one that's going to make the covenant solid. Even if you screw it up, Abraham, I'm going to keep my promise, God says. And some of you guys might have gone to Sunday school and you know that that sounds a whole lot like the kind of covenant that Jesus has with us, amen? Jesus has this covenant with us where, where he comes to us and says, hey, I'm going to die for your sins. 
You don't have to clean your life up. You don't have to be a morally perfect person. And everything you've screwed up to this point, you don't have to fix it all. You just come to Jesus. Because if you tried to fix it before you come to Jesus, you'd never come to Jesus. It would just never happen. And so he says, hey, this is an unconditional covenant. I'm going to do the thing and you're going to worship me. But if you don't, look at this. This is Romans chapter 11, verse 26. It says, the one and the one there is Jesus who rescues will come from Jerusalem and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them, he says, that I will take away their sins. You might be like, Jesus, but what's their part? (laughs) Just faith and receiving grace. He's the one that does it. He does all of it. And we might be so Sunday school and so grown up in church that we take that for granted, right? I think this is one of the mistakes that that we have in ourselves is that we've heard unconditional covenant so much. We take it so much for granted. We don't realize that that's what a marriage is supposed to be and what a marriage was supposed to be all along. See, we get the idea with our kids. With our kids, it's really easy, right? Like if you're a parent today, you have kids and guess what you do with them? You do an unconditional covenant with them. And you just do it in your daily life. It's like, hey, if, if, if you really screw this up, child of mine, I'm still going to love you. Hey, I've got expectations of you and they're my hopes and my dreams for you and how you might grow up and go into adulthood, have your old family and all this kind of stuff. But if you don't do any of the things that I had hoped for you, I'm still going to love you. You're still coming at, to, to Christmas dinner, yes? It doesn't matter. We are doing unconditional love all the time. Why do we do that? Why do we offer unconditional covenant to our kids, but we don't offer it to our spouses? Why don't we? Because sometimes you're like, well, we're just human. Ah, Yeah, you are. But you give it to them. And God wants you to give it to your spouse too. Matthew 19, verse 3 says, and the Pharisees came up to Jesus and they tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And what the Pharisees are coming to Jesus with is they're saying, is this a conditional covenant? For any cause, like I to be able to walk away, right? He burns the dinner. They're late from work. I don't like the way they smell that day or every day. I get to just divorce them, right? That's what they're asking, any cause. And here's Jesus' response. He answers, have you not read that he, that's God, who created them from the beginning, made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus is saying, you're asking me a question as if this whole marriage thing is a conditional covenant. And it's not. It's not a contract. It's unconditional. That's the way it's supposed to work. And the problem is, is that they're one now. They're not just two. They're they're one now. And what is he saying? He's saying they're family. And families don't bail. Come on. Families don't bail. Families shouldn't bail. Families shouldn't bail ever. Jesus is like, she didn't just say yes to the dress and you had a little ceremony here, okay? Like you became family with all the benefits of that. And you should count on each other and it should be unconditional even when you fail because you're gonna fail. And God made you one. And I love how he brings God into it here. He says, it's God that joined you together. Therefore, let man not separate it. And we've heard that at weddings a thousand times. Like, what does it actually mean? Does it mean that God made you soulmates? Does it mean that like, if you show up at an altar and say the I do's, that therefore that means that God helped you find your Disney princess soulmate person? It doesn't mean that actually. What he's saying is that if you come into that place and you decide to get married, that the God of the universe enters into that moment and he bonds the two of you together. God did the joining, whether you wanted it to or not, God did the joining. And it's like he glued two souls together. He glued you. He glued you in such a way that the, the, the positive side of the glue is that you love each other, right? 
And that, that if you'll enter into it, is a, it's a resurrecting kind of love where you can stay in love or get back to being in love for the rest of your life because God gave you this love and he joined you. But the negative side of it is if you try to tear it apart, it's the kind of glue that's going to tear you apart. You'll either enjoy it for the rest of your life or you'll endure it for the rest of your life because God did it. How you doing? Because now it's about to get real. <laughs> Three kinds of romantic arrangements. Let's look at them. Now you're really going to be uncomfortable. And I would say I'm sorry, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I love truth that changes us. I love truth that just helps us understand why life feels confusing sometimes. Um, the very first kind of romantic arrangement is the entanglement. Um, the National Center for Marriage and uh, or for Family and Marriage um, in 2020 said that 80 percent of the teenagers that they had surveyed expect to cohabitate. Uh, between uh, the Pew Research Center did this one between 19 and 90 in 2019, so about 30 years there, they said the percentage of adults that were cohabitating more than doubled during that time. So cohabitating is not, not um, abnormal. Co cohabitating is normal today. So entanglement, why am I calling it entanglement? Because it's this thing where it's like it's not a covenant, but you're just kind of tangling with each other. Um, that wasn't supposed to sound as sexual as it did. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it, you might start with like, hey, you've got a drawer at their house. And that's your drawer. And they've got one at your house. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. And then all of a sudden you're staying overnight and all of a sudden, they're staying overnight. And all of a sudden, there's certain nights a week that you're at their house. And there's certain nights a week that they're at your house. And that just kind of keeps growing, right? You just kind of keep drawing all those threads between each other. And you just kind of keep tangling. And then all of a sudden, it's like not only are you sharing the Netflix account, but like maybe you might buy a couch together. And that's kind of our couch. And you're kind of playing house. And it feels good. It really does. Uh, you're playing marriage, you're practicing marriage. And then you get a dog together. <laughs> Who gets to name the dog, right? <laughs> and all these things start to come together, and, and you're just, again, you're kind of tangling. And most people in our culture are doing this. And let's be real about it. Um, uh, there's, there's a very clear message from culture that, hey, listen, uh, marriage is a scary thing. A, a lot of times it fails. And so we need some practice to ensure that we, we actually are compatible as people. And so we need to practice more and more and more. And we need to play house more and more and more because you might get into it and decide that this is not the, the person for you. But here's the thing. What that assumes is that all this tangling that you've done, if you say, hey, they failed this job interview, I need to move on to the next candidate. That when you tear that apart, it shouldn't hurt so much. But it does. It rips you apart. And you're like, wait, I didn't think we were going to have all of that. Oh, yeah. Because there's things happening at the soul level you don't know about. And so it hurts. And then you move on to the next person, and that hurts too. And a lot of times we're so much into the job interview process. We're interviewing person to person to person. And what it does is it, it sows into our hearts a pattern, a pattern not of, of practicing marriage. What we're actually practicing is we're practicing criticism, unforgiveness, and divorce. We're practicing it so well, we become really, really good at it. And there's a lot that we practice. And I know this sounds old-fashioned. I know. But there's more stuff that we're practicing. Let me give you one more thing. And I could, I could just preach on this, but I don't have the time. Um, there's one more thing I want you to know. I want you to think about um, the fact that there's zero emotional security in the entanglement for you. The fact that because it might break and you might wake up to the fact that it might break, um, here's what you tend to do. 
Um, because there's zero emotional security for you in that relationship, what you're going to do is you're going you're gonna to face the idea that I'm not really getting intimate the way that I normally would get intimate. Maybe like, like I've got big secrets from my past or, or that moment of abuse or the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me and all my secrets and all my stories, I'm not going to share with this person because they might bolt. And so what you end up doing because there's no security and safety for your emotional vulnerability, you've got two options. Either option one, you just go ahead and put it all out there, all the depth of who you are to everybody, and if they bolt, you're crushed. Or option number two is you get smart to it, and you say, well, I'm just going to hold back. I'm going to hold back for some moment that may never come. Because you might practice shallow vulnerability and intimacy so much that you get used to that, used to self-protecting. And you carry that into your marriage. Because there's all kinds of things that we end up practicing and we didn't mean to practice those things. And on the road to trying to guarantee love, what we do is we, we cut it off at the knees. Yeah, I told you it was going to get real. So that's entanglement. The next one is contract. So contract is, you do say yes to the dress, and you do say the vows, and, and, and you do the rings, and you do the whole thing, but, but many of us bring that whole kind of conditional romantic relationship thing, and we bring it right into the marriage with us, and we don't realize it, because we think this is a marriage, that means it must work, and we know now that it doesn't must work, Yes? And so we brought the conditional love in and all of a sudden we find that the marriage isn't working. And what do we do now? Like maybe the job interviews are done and you've gone ahead and hired this person, but you still look at them and say, but you better not cross that line or you're out. And you still keep it conditional. It's still a contract. And when you live that way, you feel that. And when you live that way in the marriage, you are tempted to not give them the deepest parts of yourself. And you're like, well, it should just be easy because we're just going to discover that we're soulmates, right? We're just never going to fail each other. And Disney told us all that lie. (laughs) Malachi 2.16 says it like this. God says, for I hate divorce. And by the way, real quick, this is not an anti-divorce message. I'm not going to condemn you if you've divorced. I'm not going to condemn you if you're in the middle of a divorce right now. That's not what this message is all about. This message is about a love that God wants for you and that we've missed and trying to get back to that. So he says, for I hate divorce, but look at his why, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty. That's why, says the Lord of heaven's army. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. Now, I know that's said about the man and the woman in a specific way, but flip those. That's fine. It doesn't necessarily mean it only goes one way. To choose to divorce is to do cruelty to your spouse, no matter what. And I love how God goes into it. He doesn't just say, I hate divorce because it's wrong. I hate divorce because it's dirty. I hate divorce because it's bad for the kids. It's not what he says. He says, you're emotionally crushing the other person. And God cares about souls. And God wants you to experience love. And some of you guys have, have seen relationships before, maybe in the previous generations, where men, they were so stubborn about never divorcing, but man, they hated each other's guts. And you're like, I don't want that. Neither does God. Right? Just the brutal commitment is not what he's after. He's after a love that never lets go. He's after a love that keeps resurrecting itself because it's like, well, if we're stuck with each other, we better work on it. And the stuff that we better work on, man, we wouldn't work on it if we weren't stuck. Ooh, somebody say an amen to that. Come on. Love doesn't bail. The third one is the unconditional covenant. It feels like such a massive goal and it feels so old fashioned, but an unconditional covenant where you say, no matter what they do, I'm going to stick with them. No matter what I do, oh God, I hope they stick with me. 
I'm, marriage is 50-50. You already know the answer. No, it's not. It's 100 and it's 100. Amen. We don't wait around for them. We do what we're supposed to do. That's unconditional covenant. And I just acknowledge what it's such a terrifying idea, partly because you already sense, just in the words, you're giving up control, aren't you? Yeah. I know. We're all giving up control. As soon as we lock into that, just like God gave up control with us. Amen. But this is how Jesus does it. And then you're like, but hold on. What about really bad things? There are circumstances where someone bails, right? There are circumstances where a, a marriage becomes so bad, so destructive that you do need to step away. What about abuse and things like that? So let's go negative here for just a minute. We got to talk about the truth for just a minute. There's three different ways your marriage could feel. Again, correction, not your marriage, the people behind you. <laughs> so the first one, way your marriage could feel is difficult. The fights, the anger, the demands, the put-downs, the disrespect, some, the in-laws, it all feels difficult. And in the midst of that difficulty, you might need to pray that your love could stick by the grace of God. And I'm not saying just pray about it. I'm saying work on it. Amen. Making love grow is hard work by the grace of God. That's why this is a series, not a single message. It's not just about, hey, toughen up. It's about, no, go and do the work of making sure that this is an in-love marriage. We're going to talk about that in the, in the coming weeks. Disappointing. They were supposed to be the one. They were supposed to meet your needs. They were supposed to love the way that you had dreamed that they would love you, and they did not. Let's be real. You might need to pray that your love could stick by God's grace and that God would humble you both in church today and you would say, we're going to work on this. We're not going to settle for difficult and disappointing. We're going to work on this. And the third category is destructive. If there is abuse, if there is abandonment, if there is sexual betrayal, you might need to separate. Those things don't mean you must separate, but sometimes the covenant gets so shattered and your trust becomes so shattered that you, need, and sometimes for safety, that you need to move out. There are limits and they are not easy calls. And I am not your judge, by the way. I am not your judge and no pastor in town is your judge. We're not. Okay, enough with the negativity. Unconditional covenant is like golden handcuffs. Here's the thing. When I worked at Caterpillar, back in my technology career, they would give you such great health care, such great retirement, such great bonuses, and all the kind of stuff that you had people walking around the cubicles and saying, I hate my job, but these golden handcuffs are great. It's like they stick me here. Yes, they do. Very smart people, right? An unconditional covenant is a little bit like golden handcuffs. Why do we stick it out? Because there are so many benefits for you if you do. To be stuck together. Because as soon as you decide that you're not going to bolt so easily, you do start to work on things. And let's be real, you need a lot of work. Right? So last week, Pastor Ricky gave this really great example. He's like, maybe you're fasting from TV and you need to take the remote control and put it in a safe and give somebody else the combo. Why in the world would he say that? Because we know us. We know that moments of weakness will happen and we will want to bail. We need to be stuck. Because sometimes when we're stuck, we do good things. And it's that kind of stuck and I love how uh, Huey Lewis said it, the great theologian, yes, it's true, I'm so happy to be stuck with you. Some of you are too young to know what that is. But Huey Lewis is great. 
Oh my goodness. So I, I had this buddy named Steve back when I was working in technology and I went up to his cubicle one day and he was telling me about he and his wife and about all the fights that they were having. He was really, really down about it. And in the midst of the conversation, this guy Steve said to me, and you know what? I really don't know if she's the one. And I'm like, whoa, you said that about your wife. And I didn't say the next part out loud, but what I thought in my brain was, if you're saying you don't know if she's the one, then she probably isn't because you're not going to let her be. Because you've already told yourself you have an escape hatch. And as soon as you start talking to yourself like that, it's over. It's just a matter of time. Because what you've done is you've entered into something conditional instead of unconditional. Yes, it's true. I'm so happy to be stuck with you. There was a time with Linda and I, and Linda wanted me to emphasize that there was just this one time that this happened. (laughs) For those of you just waking up, I said, this is just one time this happened. But we got into this dark place with each other, and we got into this dark place, and I remember thinking and praying to the Lord, God, I'm so glad that I'm stuck with her. I'm so glad that I'm stuck with her, because the level of pain that we're both feeling right now, I think we'd both be bailing. And not only that, but because we're stuck with each other, wow, God, I could either be miserable with her for the rest of our lives... Or we could work on it. Because I'm pro-joy. Anybody else pro-joy? I like joy. I like love. And sometimes it's, it's, that, it's the golden handcuffs that get us to work through some of our biggest issues. Because some of you are going from marriage to marriage to marriage. The problem is you're taking yourself with you. Gosh, that wasn't in the notes. I wasn't going to say that. It just kind of came out. For real, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. I'm going to take a minute to slow down. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. This is a picture of what unconditional covenant is supposed to look like. This is, this is the great gift that God has for us. He prepared it, designed it for us. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Just pause there for a second. Wait a second. God just said that real love doesn't keep any record of what they did wrong. But what about this list in my head? Yeah. Love does not delight in evil when they do something evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects them. It always trusts them. It always hopes the best in them. It always perseveres, and love never fails. That's unconditional covenant. It's the way God made it. So if we have the way marriage was designed to be, what are you going to see? You're going to see dignity that you deserve. I'll let you chew on those words. Dignity that you deserve. Entanglement asks you to give yourself away for pennies. And you're worth more. We talked about for the last last several weeks, we've been talking about Imago Dei and how much you're worth. Because God made you worth something. Don't give yourself away as if you are worth nothing. Dignity that you deserve. You're worth the ring. You're worth the vows. Can I get an amen? You are worth the lifelong risk and you are worth a lifelong promise. How many decades do you think you're going to live and be married for? How many decades? How many of those will you... (laughs) One of our ushers said, maybe just one more, and then his wife slapped him. And he started to run for it, and he should have run all the way out. (laughs) 
How many, how many decades are you going to have? And how many of those decades are you still going to have hair? Some of you are doing some math right now. How many of those decades are you going to hope that you'll be loved for? All of them. them. Not just the ones that we're pretty for. Not just for the ones that we don't have an addiction in our life. Not just the decades where our mental health struggle isn't just taking over everything. We want to be loved for all the decades. You deserve it. God says you deserve it. You need safety in your intimacy because they're going to see you naked. They are. And they're going to hear about your biggest fears. And they're going to find out about all your dark secrets. And you need safety if you're going to give that away. You need love that won't die, that keeps no record of wrongs. And you need a love legacy to maybe pass on to somebody else. Because, man, if you, could, if you could follow Jesus and believe him and fight against what this culture is driving you to, and if you could do it his way, what a blessing to pass that on to your kids. And then they don't have to start way behind like you started way behind. It's a, it's a legacy you can give them. This is, this is how we could do it. Maybe broken, maybe, maybe barely there, but this is how we could do it. And maybe you're like, yeah, but my kids are already grown and I'm already past that first marriage and it was a wreck. I get it. That's a lot of us. That's a lot of us. Then maybe it's your second marriage and maybe the grandkids get to see it. Or maybe it's your third marriage. And maybe all your family's grown. And you'll give it to one other couple at work or in a Bible study or something. But oh God, would you give us a legacy in our love that is there's one tiny bit of light in a dark world. We need it. Okay, so we're gonna have a moment of prayer right now. I want you to stay in your seats and Jake is gonna play over us and what, here's what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a little bit of a taster of what these prayer hours are like during the week. And we're going to give you time to just pray, just you and Jesus. And I know this is not normal church and this, some of you are already getting like really nervous and worried. Nobody's going to put you on the spot. I just want you to have some time, just you and God praying. And we got some prayers that are going to be on screen for you to pray through. And some of those are for some of us. And you might just pick one of those and say, that's my prayer. But let me just say, before we pray anything, take the mask off. Take the mask off just for a minute that you've got it all together. Because you're not going to change if you're not honest about the truth of where you are and the truth of where God wants you to be. You got to start with truth. So you're all a bunch of screw ups. Amen? Amen? Can we just say it? A lot of folks cohabitate, even in the church. A lot of folks get themselves to a really limited kind of intimacy, and then they take that limited, shallow intimacy into their marriage, and it's creating all kinds of problems. A lot of us live conditionally with our love, and we're suffering as a result, and God needs to revive us all. So take the masks off. We're a bunch of broken people in church today. And I want you to pray. And so go ahead and close your eyes and you're going to have this space to pray. And I'm going to give you minutes in this room and he's going to play and you're not going to sing. I'll just give you a little, uh, little bit of coaching. Some Christians close their eyes when they pray to limit distractions. Others of them pray with their eyes open. There's no Bible verse that says one or the other. I would say if you're sitting next to your spouse, if you squeeze their hand while you pray, Extra bonus points for that. And bonus points are good points, amen? (laughs) But glance at the screen, say, God, which which of these is us? Which of these is my prayer right now? 
and have your time with Jesus. I hope that your time with Jesus was sweet and that he was speaking to you about the things that you were asking. Um, I pray that through this series, too, that you would keep seeking him. Um, he hears us, and he, he wants to hear from you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for this time that we had to worship you freely and to hear truth from your word, God. I pray right now, Lord, for marriages and relationships across this church, that you would come in and that you would resurrect things that are dead, Lord, that you would revive love that once was, that you would right wrongs, God, that you would come in and move in power. Lord, we trust that when we come to you with our brokenness, that you hear us and you want to mend us. Sometimes it just takes us asking I pray that we would all humble ourselves this morning to ask. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you hear us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.